Hello and welcome to Highland Showcase, bringing you a snapshot of life in the Highlands of Scotland. Today we've come back to Fern Farm to catch up with John Scott. More from that later on. First of all, let's take a look at what's in this week's show. Coming up on this week's show, we catch up with sculptor Barry Grove during one of his largest projects yet, we meet Rory Stone from Highland Fine Cheeses and we make our last visit of the series to Fern Farm and catch up with the lambing. Don't forget to follow Highland Showcase on Facebook where you can keep up to date with what the team are doing. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first got into to being a sculptor? Well, I, mean, I attended art college in the, the mid to late 80s um, in Dundee and I did ceramics as a main discipline. We had to do a subsidiary subject um, and I, I chose to do sculpture, carving in, in, in stone um, and I found a material that I, I loved to use. Um, it became quite a problem because I hardly did any clay work after that, I just wanted to, to pound chisels off of stone. But that, that's how I ended up you know, carving in this material and being a sculptor. And can you tell us about some of your um, previous um, creations that you've made? I've, I've been very fortunate and most of my work has been to commission. I've taken part in very few exhibitions. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm doing the work knowing that, you know, I'll be, I'll be paid for it, which is a, a luxury as a self-employed um, sculptor. Done a lot of um, large-scale public art projects, um, a lot of historical projects, um, some restoration work for, for museums um, and recreating monuments for, for museums. Um, a lot in the Victorian times, a lot of the collections were, were centralised in Edinburgh, um, London, etc. So for a lot of the regional museums, I've done recreations of, of Pictish stones, for instance. Um, you've uh, recreated a stone that's very local to here as well. Yeah, the, the Hilton of Cadball stone um, down, down the village of Hilton. Yeah, that, that was a, a four-year project um, in, in total. Uh, that was a, a very much you know, embedded within the, the community. Um, and I enjoyed doing it for, for that reason. You know, pe people saw this blank, you know, huge piece of stone arrive and then you know, they watched it over many years and taking shape. And, and it gave that sculpture a, a sense of belonging. Um, and that's what I love doing about public art, but that was a luxury to actually be working within the community that it was going to be decided in. Most of the times I'll be doing it here, um, like, like my current project, um, and it's transported 250 miles away to, and, and just kind of plopped into, into place, as it were. I felt that that would be wrong um, to try to recreate an ancient Pictish stone using pneumatics, so that was all, all mallet and chisel work, exactly the same as it was done 1500 years ago. Um, you know, pe people you know look at me and, and they're quite amazed that you know you can do that. You know, it's, but it's still just the eye-hand coordination that that was. You know, it's a very human endeavour um, to do these things in stone has been for millennia, and that's what I really enjoyed doing Hilton. Um, for that, it's also very peaceful. You just get the kind of thwack of the mallet against the, the chisel and the sound of the birds in the background. So, you know, it kind of transported me back to, to Pictish times, uh, as it were. You can put a bit of your personality into, into the feeling of the stone. Ab absolutely. I think, you know, if, if I had carved half of it and then someone else came along and, and finished it, you would see a difference. You know, it's like handwriting. We all have our own kind of way of carving, our own way of doing undercuts, of, of finishing the, the detail. Um, I try to be as faithful as possible, but it's, it certainly is, um, you know, my style of, of carving. And by using uh, the old equipment, how did that change the way that you were actually doing the carving? Um, it certainly made it um, a much slower, um, you know, and, and a more contemplative way of, of, of working. Let's say you don't have a noisy machine in the background, or there was no machines in the background, it was just my, my arms and mallet and, and chisel. So it certainly kind of made it seem more... More, more real to me. Without giving away too much about your current project, mm. can you can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, it's commissioned by a whisky company, Glenmorangie. Um, they that Pictish stone at Hilton that I, I carved, they have a very much a local connection to that area. Um, and I think it was about 2004, 2005 they adopted um, what they now call their signet, and it's their emblem. Um, their, their logo, which is on all their, all their bottles and, and promotional materials. Um, I'm carving that um, in, in, in this piece of stone that's for their, their bottling plant down in, in Livingston, so that gives them a local connection um, you know, down, down there. Now the stone itself, it's also from the north of Scotland? It is, it's from uh, a quarry called Clashach Quarry, which is uh, Hopeman near Elgin, just across the Firth from here. 
Um, I, I love using the stone. It's a very um, tight grain stone, so you can get a lot of really fine detail in it. It's a hard, durable stone, and I think it matures and ages um, over time. It grows a lovely patina of age. I really enjoy. I mean, th this, uh, the leaves on, on this sculpture, for instance, within nine months to a year will start to go green um, and change colour, so it's, it's in a constant state of flux. Uh, just, it's just not obvious to, you know, as, as you're looking at it, it takes time for, for that to change. So although it's it's made of stone, it's really a living sculpture. Oh, very much so, oh, very much. I mean, people think of stone as a dead and inert um, substance. It's, it's not at all. It's in, it is in this constant state of, 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 of change. It's just over a long period of time. The stone itself is 300, 350 million years old. Um, and, you know, when, when I'm carving it, I'm aware of this. You know, it's such an ancient, old material. Um, so if it takes me two years to do a project, it's, it's really nothing in the, in the big scheme of things. You know, it should last over a millennia. Now, you said it's, it's a hard stone. How does that change the way that you need to work with it? Um, well, there's a, a, a physicality um, a, about you know, working, working stone. Um, nowadays, we've got pneumatic chisels um, and things, and I'm, I'm, I'm filled with respect for the ancients who just had mallet and chisel and, and you know, arms, you know, eye-hand coordination, whereas now we have the luxury of, of angle grinders um, and air tools. And that's why we're working outside. Well, I don't have a, a workshop big enough that this is going to fit into um, the, the sheer physicality of, of having a crane to, to deliver this, to, to, to lift it. Um, I don't have a studio that would be capable of, of, of doing that. So I'm very much weather dependent on, on this project. One of the other pieces that you've worked on was uh, for a member of the royal family. Indeed, yeah. In 2005, I did a, a two-ton um, commemorative marriage stone for, for uh, Prince Charles and, and Camilla. Um, and it's at Burke Hall, their kind of holiday home in the Highlands. So that's something there to always remind them of the day that, that you've had a little bit of a part in. Um, I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, they can see it from, from their house. Um, and one, one side is carved um, with, with thistles. It's a very um, Scottish-based design. Um, and that's the side they see from their house and um, looking down into their garden. Um, and when they're looking back at the house, it's a more architectural appearance. Um, and it's two intertwining seas with, with crowns above them and, and the date. Can you tell us how you got involved with this project here? I was introduced to Barry last year. He was looking for an assistant to help him on this project. Um, my background's in glass making, um, predominantly cutting and polishing, and a lot of the techniques are quite similar. And I also do lime mortar pointing, so I've had a bit of experience working in stone, but never anything on this epic scale. So you've been able to uh, transfer your skills from glass to this particular type of stone? Yes, definitely. A lot of the techniques are similar and I like using quite heavy machinery. I like to cut and grind and I don't mind working in messy environments or being outside and we've had to work a lot in quite awful weather conditions but, um, but I really enjoy it. I like physical work. So this will be the first sort of project of this grand scale? Definitely, yeah. It's been a real privilege that Barry's asked me to be involved and, and let me assist him and he's taught me a lot and it's, it's been a fantastic experience and something I'll, I'll never ever forget. Can you tell us how this, how this is similar to your, your glass work? A lot of the glass work I do is it's a, a reductive process, you're taking away material to make a finished product and this is quite similar in that you, you have to be quite intuitive, you have to feel feel the material and um, it sort of comes through you. Um, grinding and polishing and finishing are something that I've done a lot of and I really enjoy and I find it quite satisfying. Um, and I enjoy working with a material that can be hard and soft at the same time and that you can get really beautiful edges with. You know, with glass you can polish it to a real high, high gloss finish and looks amazing. And something like this you can fine it down to such a smooth surface it almost looks like skin and get really fine edges um, it's, it's just amazing and to be creating something which is going to be around for a long time too that is it's awesome I still haven't quite got my head around it yet you know that this is going to be here a lot longer than all of us and who knows what's going to happen with it it's, it's quite fantastic it seems to change Every day it can change 
throughout the day, depending on the light and the weather conditions, whether it's wet or dry. Um, the colours change in the stone, which makes the textures change as well. And it's quite amazing the, the way that, to think that moss and lichen will grow on this and insects will make their homes in it. And it will change a lot once it's in situ and it's not covered by the canopy. Um, and the, the colours will, will really change over time. You know, it'll look really different in a year, two years, three years. So it'll be quite interesting to go back and visit the stone and see how it's become part of that landscape and, and changed very much in colour. Um, and the, the iron will bleed down as well. That will make a big difference. Um, but every day it, it, it looks different. It depends on the sunlight, whether it's wet or dry and whether it's misty. It's, it's, it's amazing because every day it's different. And being working up here, being outside, this is your office, it's just incredible. You know, the landscape and the sky, it's fantastic. It's very different to being based in a studio, which I've really enjoyed. And you were talking about the insects. Now you've had experience of being covered in insects already. We've found caterpillars, which we've moved out the way so we don't interfere with them. And some mornings we've come out and the whole sculpture's covered in spider webs, really fine, small spider webs and all the gaps. And then when we start working and the dust goes into the air, they, they catch the dust and they're white and it just looks so beautiful, I'm taking quite a lot of photographs of that because it's, it's quite magical. And then they all disappear, I don't know where they go. If you could sum up your, your sculpture career, how would you do that? I would just say it's, it's a passion for the material, you know, it's the only stone that I work in and I just love the, the kind of ancient, you know, it's, it's the oldest material that, that I can work with, you know, it's, it's as old as the earth itself. Um, and I think it's, it's durability. I, I love the fact that it can be outdoors. That's why I have a passion for, for public art. I, I'm not so keen on doing uh, gallery-based exhibitions. I, I love the, the play of, of light on stone. I love how it ages, how it grows this patina of, you know, of, of, of skin. Um, and, and it's in a constant state of flux. And each time you go to see a piece of sculpture outside, it can look completely different depending on, on the lighting conditions. I, I, and I love the idea that you know, in a millennia, it will still be around. Okay, Rory, can you tell us how Highland Fine Cheeses came about? Highland Fine Cheeses was set up by my parents. Um, it, traditionally, they, were, they had a very small farm, and I'd always believed that they were dairy farmers, but as it turns out, they only had 14 cows, which doesn't really, it's more of a, I think it was the good life um, in, the, in the 1950s, although I think it was a pretty tough, tough existence. So um, the dairy really wasn't viable. And my mother decided that um, she could make crowdy. My father complained after the war, nobody made crowdy anymore because all the milk went off to the milk marketing board to be pasteurized and packaged. You couldn't sell unpasteurized milk. So she said, well, I know how to make crowdy. Um, she, I thought it was her mother who taught her, but it was actually um, my grandmother, uh, uh, Via Fraser, Caroline Fraser, who lived down at the Plains at Tain, had taught her how to make crowdy on a stove. So she took a 10 gallon churn of milk because at that time the milk officer had said, you can't, we won't take your milk anymore because it's not clean enough. And uh, she kept it in a bath to keep it nice and warm so that it would, um, it would sour, naturally sour. Um, all the lactose in the milk turns into lactic acid. And then eventually it sets if you just leave milk long enough. So traditionally, Crowdy was made on crofts and small holdings farms around the highlands when it was cattle country. Because cheese is basically about preserving milk and uh, crowdy was the simplest way of preserving the milk. Milk, um, like all life, requires warmth, moisture, uh, time and food to survive. So that all the bacteria in the milk has this lovely wet food source full of milk sugar lactose. If you warm it up uh, and if you give it enough time, you'll get good and bad bacteria developing in the milk. So if you inhibit any part of that, if you reduce the moisture, take away some of the food, the lactose, uh, cool it down, or just eat it quickly, you've restricted uh, the opportunity for any bad bacteria to develop in the milk. So in order to preserve the milk before pasteurization, refrigeration, sterilization, um, the best thing you could do was to convert it into cheese. You'd always let it settle first, skim the cream off the top so you had something to churn into butter got a cold wet miserable climate we all need a fat store and somebody to cook with and then you're left with this partially skimmed milk and people would leave it beside the range where it'd stay nice and warm and overnight it would acidify it would the, the lactose would turn into um, lactic acid 
so you know that's your warning sign when you taste slightly sour milk, slightly sharp milk, uh, that something's got in there and it's going off. And then it would eventually coagulate, it would set, uh, like a bottle of milk that's been left lying around for too long, and you get a sort of yellowy liquid, which is the whey, and you get this solid lump, all the, the goodness of the milk sort of contained in this, this lump. And then um, the milk was scrambled like eggs and hung up in a muslin or a pillowcase, a little bit of salt added for flavoring and a bit more preservation. And you've got uh, one of the simplest cheeses in the world to make. And that was made, probably taught us by the Vikings and was made throughout the Highlands. And I think it's still made in Scandinavia as well. Coming up in part two, more from Rory Stone at Highland Fine Cheeses. Starting from, from just Crowdy, you've gone on to so much more. Yes, I mean, Crowdy was the great sort of one-trick pony. You know, we, we thought, well, my parents thought, gosh, it, it works. What happened was, my, it was uh, really because my father just wanted some Crowdy. And my mother said, well, you know, I'll make 10 gallons worth, which was far too much. I think she made about 18 pounds of, of Crowdy. So they were constantly in debt to one of the local grocers. So they wrapped it up and said, do you think you could sell this? And he rang a few days later and said, that was great. Can we have some more? which they hadn't really expected. So from these very humble beginnings of making cheese in a bath, yes, the, this little business, which is still pretty humble, um, ha has has grown a bit. But originally it was this one trick pony, add wild garlic leaf, uh, chop up, um, try different nuts and herbs in it, uh, roll it in peppercorns. So, you know, you had one very basic product that we could add flavors to. And Crowdy lends itself to that. If you, you know, it's, it's lovely by itself. It's lovely when it's still warm, just made it, but it, you can, it carries things very well. You can make great smoked mackerel pate with it and all sorts of things. It's a great ingredient. The most peculiar cheese we make is called Kabuk, which I'm always rude about. Um, it's, it's really, it's a ripened double cream. It does, it's heritage does come from the Isles, the Outer Hebrides from um, the 14th century and it was a ripened cream, a ripened double cream product. But my mother reintroduced it and then added the pinhead oatmeal to that side because it was always eaten on oat cakes. Uh, and the addition of the pinhead, because people, you know, oat cakes weren't so readily available in the 1960s, uh, by putting the oatmeal on the outside, you were sort of combining the two and it gave it a nice texture and a nice finish. 99 out of 100 people think, what on earth is this? You know, they just, oh, I can't believe it. But one in a hundred is, is a complete addict. And um, so people, it's very much a Scottish specific product, still sells very, very well in Scotland. It's small, you know, there's always a little bit of mail order going south of the border. And so that was really it. There was Crowdy and Crowdy with flavors and Cabock um, right up until uh, the, the early nineties. And is that for you too, cool? I'd had various bursts of, of, of being involved. Family business is always fraught. You end up wanting to wring each other's neck most of the time. So in 1994, things weren't, weren't going quite as well as, uh, as in the past. And we, we needed a new direction. So there was a general request that would I come back and give a hand. And of course, being demanding and difficult, I said, well, I will if I'm 51% because that's the way, only way any of you will behave. So that gave me the right to sack the rest of the family once I got that. And I could concentrate on trying to produce things that I thought looked and smelt and tasted um, a bit more like like cheese. Um, we experimented a lot, uh, and I think, as is often the case in in UK manufacture, we, we go out with great optimism and we're quite prepared to trip up and fall over. We'll always get back up and have another go. But eventually, I thought it was probably a good idea to ask somebody who knew what they were talking about. And so we brought in all sorts of help, Kathy Biss from Achmore over at Plockton, um, just to, to give us some direction on, on, because I thought if we could make Crowdy, we should be able to make a blue cheese. Um, and there was just disaster after disaster. We filled a lot of skips. So uh, eventually, we actually stole a recipe. Uh, well, we bought it in, but for a very small price, uh, from Aberdeen. From, and that's why we ended up making Strathdon Blue in Tain, because it was originally made in, in Aberdeen at the Twin Spires Creamery. And there was a collection of names, as I discovered, for Strathdon Blue. Um, uh, Gordon Blue, Highland Blue, Strathdon Blue. And they thought of a novelty name, you can -a whack it, but luckily, um, the one I bought was Strathdon Blue. And so that was that was introduced in about 99. 
And that was a real baptism of fire because blue cheese is about as complicated as you could get. So it was a massively naive choice to have gone from making crowdy to, to blue cheese. But it certainly immediately gave us a presence south of the border and uh, people stopped regarding us as being, I thought, because I think we'd really missed the foodie revolution of the 80s. We were sort of a, a bit behind and people stopped looking at us as some sort of little tartan, Tory gifty type outfit and said, oh, these people are cheesemakers. So, Cabot and Crowdy and Black Crowdy, as we now call it, very important parts of, our, of the company, still very big players for us. But now we we can add on these these, as we would call them, artisan, um, traditional uh, cheeses, albeit most of the ideas stolen from the French. And it's not just cow's milk that you use to make cheese. No, we've started. We've got a, a local supply of goat's milk and um, goat's milk and sheep's milk just makes really nice cheese and uh, it's I mean I wish it was as easy with cow's milk but we, last year we, we really started to get quite arrogant we kept putting the little uh, goat's milk and, and ewe's milk breeze into competitions and fully expecting either to win the class or at least a gold medal uh, whereas in the past with our cow's milk products if we got a bronze we were absolutely delighted or even a sort of recognized um, so they've given us fantastic profile and especially south of the border. Of course, you don't get, well, you get different yields from ewe's milk and goat's milk, but they're much more expensive. And so uh, whilst they give us a bit of presence and, and, and interest in competitions and things, they're never going to be the, the staple that, that holds us together. But, um, but I thought, I mean, at the time we were trying to be really clever and we thought we'd be like Glen Morangy with different finishes, you know, so you'd make a, a Strathon blue, blue traditionally with, with, with cow's milk and then we could make a, a, a goat's milk finish or a ewe's milk finish, a bit like a port wood cask or a sherry wood cask. It all got terribly confusing, so we ended up giving the cheeses different identities. It was a, a, a slightly smarter idea, but it's basically employing exactly the same technology, the same cultures, the same environment, um, uh, but just a, a different milk source and a, and a different label. So can you tell us a bit about the, the cheese that you were involved with? with some famous names? Oh, well, we, do, we did uh, we had quite a bit of fun uh, making a, a product with uh, Alex James, ex Bleu, and it, he teamed up with a guy called Juliet Harbert, who runs the British Cheese Awards. And he just, he's always loved cheese. He's fascinated by cheese. So he introduced a range of really very nice goat's milk products from the South. And then he said, I think I want a blue cheese. Can we, can we find someone to work with to make a, a, a blue cheese? So Juliet had him down at the British Cheese Awards and he tried our cheese and he said, oh, I quite like that, yeah, let's go and talk to him. So uh, we fiddled around, we mucked around with different ideas and then we said, well, maybe we could make a, a, a square blue cheese, a cubic blue cheese, that'd be unusual. So we imp employed pretty much the, the, the Strathon Blue technology, but we found different square moulds. The cheese is different because even the very slightest change in shape or style or drainage in this case, because there were many, many more holes in the side of the plastic moulds so that the curd would drain faster. And it made a smoother, it made a really quite a nice cheese. So we thought, well, this is quite good. I might be able to do something with this. So then we hunted around for names. And then Alex came up with an option which we thought was perhaps the least worst option, uh, which was Blue Monday. Um, one of his ideas was E minus seven because that was his favorite blues chord. We thought that was just taking it a little far. So we went for Blue Monday and it sort of worked. It fiddled along a bit. It's a, it's a nice product. Um, and then oh, there was some massive falling out and Juliet and Alex sort of split. The, they decided to go separate ways. And then Alex decided to register the name Blue Monday without telling us. So sadly, I said, well, I don't think I can really invest a lot in a product that, that could walk out the door at any time. Uh, so I'm afraid to say there's been a parting of the ways, which is a great pity because he's a really he's very charming and, and quite a, a fun guy. Um, but I guess I'm too thrawn. I don't like being told what to do. And anyway, when he started making cheddar tikka masala by throwing some cumin in reconstituted cheddar, I thought he'd really lost any credibility. <laughs> so can you tell us about the involvement with the North Highland Initiative? That's really been quite an interesting project. Um, His Royal Highness Prince Charles or as he likes to be known, the Duke of Rothsey, um, enjoys coming up to his grandmother's former home, um, the Castle of May. And he asked if he could do anything uh, to support um, the local farming community. Um, this is something he's done throughout the country and to try and help set up some kind of initiative to uh, secure a, a premium price for uh, the fine beef and lamb that's produced from the, 
the Northern Highlands. We immediately thought, oh, we've got to get in on the back of this one. And so we started um, making a version of Strathon Blue, which we renamed Highland Blue. Um, it was originally marketed as May Selections Highland Blue. And I think perhaps we jumped the gun a bit. We were perhaps, we could have done a little bit more product development. It sells, it sells in Australia, it sells in London. Um, but we think now is a good time uh, to start to, to really try and promote the, the brand again, because it's beginning to get fixed in people's people's minds. So you're expanding into new markets? Well, yes, I mean, we we have to, um, to, to really to survive. I mean, put simply, I've got two children and an expensive wife, um, but if we were just to concentrate, the marketplace is too small in, in, in rural Scotland for us to survive if we just did farmers markets or local shops and hotels and restaurants. And uh, the business has to grow. So we have to protect our, our traditional business, uh, and that's easy because there's a limit to the amount of ewes milk and, um, uh, and uh, goat's milk that we can, we can get our hands on. And so that means that we, we're looking after them uh, and trying to give them the very best, but at the same time, we want to be shoveling pallets out the back door to all the major multiples. Um, and they, I mean, the market has a voracious appetite for, for new ideas. Uh, they're always asking what's new, what's new. And most supermarket buyers are sitting there going, well, I'm a bit fed up of hearing about cheddar, you know, <laughs> is there anything else going on? And we've actually just started working with one of the big discounters, Aldi. Uh, we were a bit terrified to start with. They came up to visit the site about a couple of years ago. And, and uh, first of all, we went to have a look at one of the shops. I'd never been in an Aldi before, so we had a look around and like, oh, I mean, I can't believe this. You can pick up a piece of cheese for 40 pence. You know, I don't think I could make it for that. But they were very keen that we, we did something with them. And then two Christmases ago, they, they said, uh, they rang and said, we've got this box. Do you think you could find some cheese that would fit in it? Because I, I just thought, no, there's no way we can deal with it. They'll, they'll never pay us enough money. We couldn't possibly do it. So I thought it was a very strange approach. So they sent me the box and we did find that uh, it was Black Crowdy and Cabot fitted in the box. It seemed to work. They wanted Strathdon Blue, but I was a bit protective about that. I thought, oh, that's my special cheese. I'm not sure I can give you that. So we put the Black Crowdy and Cabot in. It worked quite well. And we sent it down to them first. They just order by a pallet. Everything's done by the pallet. And we sent it down. And then uh, I think it went into store the Monday before Christmas. And then on the Wednesday, they called and said, we've sold 96% of the stock. Is there any chance you could get us another pallet? And so it, it really opened our, our eyes to just uh, how well they do in, in their section of the market, how they can really shift volumes. So we've done a bespoke range uh, for Aldi of uh, four, four products, taking from all the technology that we have on the, on the site already. But they've been very easy to deal with uh, and they're very encouraging. Now when we visited this morning, you were, um, you were going making some brie? Yes. Uh, the, the because we've ventured into mold ripened with with uh, with blue cheese, um, we were told we really ought to have a go at making brie styles. And the fear is that because we do so many different styles, that we might end up looking like a jack of all trades and a master of none. So we thought, well, we really need something to hang our hats on. We've got all these fresh cheeses and and cabbage, the, tr the traditional products, and then we've got uh, cheddar as a sort of a a mainstay for putting any spare milk. So what's our core business going to be? And that's been the mold ripened, that's been blue and brie. They are also the two products that give us the most headaches. And if if anything is likely to go wrong, it will be with the blue cheese or the brie. Um, they're just nightmares <laughs> to, to work with. That's probably why a lot of people don't bother. Um, but they're certainly giving us growth. So the next big challenge really, if we are to expand, if we are to keep growing and I think that'll be that'll be growth by finding more customers or, or building up our trade with existing customers rather than making more different cheeses I've complicated it enough already um, but if we we are to grow we're going to have to find a new site so the the big I mean this year we've had growth and we're back to profitability this year last year was a bit of a nightmare with milk prices and all the rest and not having control of our own milk supply that made life very difficult but now it's uh, looking a, a, a lot better we certainly wouldn't be able to take on the kind of borrowing required to build a whole new factory, but um, but it's moving in the right direction. And we desperately need a new site, our old sites. 
was originally in 1870 the town brewery and then I think it was my father's milking parlor in the 1950s so um, uh, but that's that's going to be a fairly major investment. So can you tell us about your passion for cheese? Well, somebody said you should never trust a skinny chef and I'd like to think I'm still reasonably svelte but I do love food I love good food and good wine um, so cheese I mean I you know really I'm just a lucky little boy who inherited a, a an existing business but um, I do love good cheese and I'm always uh, aware of the fact that we need to keep raising our game because every time you go to France and eat what's available there or Spain or Italy you realize that they're they're quietly thrashing us at the job uh, but all the time we feel as if we're getting better at it and it, it's much less about winning medals and awards for one or two batches it's much more about raising the game from the bottom up there is something intrinsically yeah it, it's deeply satisfying making a cheese and tasting it and thinking oh that's that's above average that's that's not bad and then giving it to people and they're going oh, it's quite nice that one rather like that and that's hugely satisfying and I think there's something just terribly nice about taking um, taking milk and, and, and making it into uh, another product but milk and cheese making it's mercurial and it the minute you start to get lax about it it bites back because every day is its own vintage you can't take a little bit of yesterday's and some of tomorrow's and make a little cocktail of it so you iron out some of the imperfections once you've made it that's it you're stuck with it join us in part three where we catch up with john scott at fair and farm Evening folks, I'd just like to introduce my two assistants for today. I've got Lisa here from New Zealand who's given us a hand with the lambing. She's unfortunately got the night shift shows. Um, she does some fairly long hours, that's why she's a little bit tired. And right on cue, this is Bobby, our pet lamb. Bobby's going to be a bit of an assistant, a bit of a, give us a demonstration on how he, he should be coming into the world. One of the main jobs and one of Lisa's main jobs is to make sure that no, none of the ewes have problems lambing. And I'll, I'll just show you some of the various different presentations that the Bobby movie could arrive into the world. Ideally, we'd like them like this, Lisa. Yeah? yeah. Feet coming first, nose, and out he comes, nice and simple. What we don't want is this, in which case Lisa would have to hook the hook one leg if you just pull that leg. How would you you, you just reach you, in and sort of hook it around like this? Yeah, and, and to get two coming right. Yeah. To get them both coming together and then pull. Oh, so what would you do if you just had this flapping about at, at the back of the U? Basically, just the same thing. Reach back and try and get, just try and get one leg around and then feel for the other one as well. Try and get the same position. Well, what about uh, if Bobby was just coming like this, Wait, this waving at you? Same case. You just reach in, try and feel for the back leg. You'd, you'd be hooking that there, would you? Yeah. Yeah. And then pulling it round like this, getting the other so leg the same. So there's just two legs. There is Maybe. a is a danger with a big lamb coming backwards like that that you might do damage to the ribs. But normally it's not normally too bad. And uh, fair comment, yeah. Normally just it's normally pretty easy. But you get all sorts of presentation. You can get you can get upside down this. You can get upside down this. You can get. See if this Bobby here was a was a twin, he might have his mate's other two legs here as well. Which is you got to work out which which legs belong to which lamb. But um, it's quite satisfying when you've got a, a, a difficult lambing and you manage to get it out successfully. Um, we do get one or two that uh, don't come out successfully as well. But the beauty of that is that when we've got a pet lamb like Bobby here, we can get him set on to a mother that's maybe lost a lamb. So um, it's a happy ending for everyone. What kind of year has it been so far for the lambing? This has been one of the, the hardest 
Lammings. To be honest, this is not a good day to talk to me about it because I'm fed up being cold. I'm fed up seeing the ewes go off the milk with the wind driving in. Uh, I just, it's, 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 got, it's got to me to this morning. And when I go out and I find a really good lamb thriving dead for no reason, it just annoys me. And you've been farming for quite a few years, so for you to say it's a bad year, then... It, it, it is a bad year, but we've, to be fair, comparatively lucky to other parts of the country, but it's it's been relentless. We've just been nice to get... I mean, my spirits will pick up when we get a, a, a nice warm, growthy day and the grass is growing and the lambs are playing and it all sorts out, but you just... I'm fed up being cold. I suppose that's part of farming. You have some really low times and some really high times. You don't enjoy the good times if you don't have one or two bad times, but this time it stopped. <laughs> but the actual productivity of the, the lambing, has that been fairly good? Well, we've had a higher number of deaths than usual, a lot of it due to the weather. We've had niggly little problems. We problem with Campylobacter, um, a little problem with scour in the lambs. But basically, the cold has been the, the problem. Some ewes getting mastitis and that cold east wind on those when it was really strong and uh, if there's anything wrong with a lamb at all it was it was curtains so although we feel it a bit cold it really affects the the animals oh it does um i mean there's, there's not a lot of shelter on this farm we put out big bales for shelter uh, and they use that a lot and but it's it, it, it's 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 been a hard spring for them and when they would grass would give everything a lift so we'll hope for some nicer, nicer weather and this cold wind to go away. Yeah, I would love that. I would love that. So these calves here, John, they were born in the last 24 hours? Yeah, um, all three have been born since yesterday lunchtime, yeah, so the last 24 hours. They're all heifer calves. We seem to be getting a run of heifer calves this last couple of days. Um, not many bull calves at all, but it tends to go like that. And most years you end up with a with a, a roughly even split between bulls and heifer calves. Um, what we try and do is we, we calve either end here and, and as they calve we move them into, into pens with a bit more space, um, always ensuring there's plenty um, clean straw in the pens so that we reduce the chance of infection through the, the wet navel when the calf is born. Um, but we've just got to be very careful, we try not to go in into the pens unless there's two of us here just in case. Our cows are very quiet but you just don't know when a when a calf has been born, when a cow is giving birth, that's a critical stage, and that sometimes cows that are quiet the rest of the year can can react differently. And y you have to to a certain degree accept that and, and realize that they're only being protected for their calf, and it's a natural instinct. Um, so we try and work with them. So John, it's been a few weeks since we've been here last. Can you give us an update to how it's been going? Yeah, we've been pretty busy lambing. The weather's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, we're still waiting for spring um, before we know it'll be summertime. But no, the weather really has um, made life hard um, for us. Harder in other parts of the country where they've had more snow. But winter supplies, forage supplies are really getting pretty low now. And we're needing uh, heat to get some grass growth. But uh, we're well through lambing, um, this lambing that is. And uh, calving's about halfway. The spring works. Um, well up to date as well, although the ground has been cold, it's been very dry and I'd rather put the uh, seed into the ground in cold and dry conditions than warm and wet, so just needs for, uh, just looking for a bit of heat now and a bit of growth. So you're saying there you're, you're into your calving now as well? Yes, we've got about 100 cows here and we're about halfway through at the moment. Um, a lot of nice short run calves on the, on the ground now, um, but really just making sure that they're okay and we calve them in the big shed so that we can keep an eye on them and then uh, once they're a couple of days old we put tags in them and they go outside. But it's very important that we're, we're there just in case a cow needs a hand calving. Most of the time they calve themselves but we've just got to be there to help out if need be. So how does the cold weather affect the cows? Well, our cows are outwintered um, and actually cold weather doesn't affect them too much. It doesn't mean that they need a bit more energy to keep themselves warm so maybe a bit more feed. What we do is we bring them in for um, for calving so that we can keep an eye on them, watch them 24 hours a day, just in case they need assistance. And it's very important that if there's a, a leg back when a calf's been born that we can be there to, to sort it out and help it. Um, once the cows have calved, they're put outside fairly quickly. Um, their calves are tagged and weighed if they're pedigrees. They go outside and, and that's when the cold then does affect things. In that if there's no grass, they need more food to keep, them, keep the milk on them. It's very important calves get enough milk when they're born. 
um, in the first few months of life it's really important that the, the cows are milking so what we're looking for is a bit of heat a bit of warmth so that the grass will grow grass is key to this operation it's both on the sheep and the cattle side of things we need grass as early as possible in the spring if people are out walking in those fields what should they be looking out for well for a start they, sh they should be walking in the fields with uh, cows and calves keep well away cows are very protective of newborn calves and just don't go anywhere near cows and calves please just keep away even if you're walking next door to them um, just keep a bit of distance because they can be very dangerous uh, when that calf is born and very protective of the of the newborn calves and there's been some tragedies uh, people out walking dogs and um, trying to save their dogs and even themselves and, and, and failing so they are dangerous animals when they have newborn calves at foot and indeed at any time of the year be aware when you're walking near cows and young stock and the other thing to think about as well, when you're walking near ewes and lambs at this time of year, when they're fairly new turned out, um, they'll, they'll run away from your dog, they'll run away from you and they'll get mixed up. And sometimes when mismothering occurs, the lamb maybe doesn't find its mother again and well, it'll starve. So just think carefully about where you're walking at this time of year and um, just be better be safe than sorry. Now, like any animal, the um, accidents can happen. And we've seen one of your calves that unfortunately had a, a little bit of an accident. Yeah, no, that was an Angus cow. Um, she had a lovely set of twins and we, we fostered one onto an old cow. We'd lost a calf, unfortunately. and She was left with one of her own calves. And unfortunately, another cow or, or even her stood on the calf by accident, I think, in, in the cattle fold. That's grand. Um, luckily, it was a, a low down break. So um, that's preferable to one higher up the leg. And uh, we got the vet out and um, made a great job of uh, plastering it up and that was her back 10 days later to plaster it again and yeah it's making good progress so that shouldn't affect that calf at all um, he'll be out to the field with the rest in a couple of weeks time and he'll catch up and I've seen him playing already with the first cast on so pretty hopeful he'll make a full recovery. Yeah. So it's just like any of us if we break our legs? Exactly that except we don't go to Inverness they might not appreciate that if I turned up with a calf um, no no the vets pop out here and we get it sorted out. So as the, the summer is hopefully approaching, you've got some events coming up here in the farm? Yeah, well we hope to open up the farm um, uh, for Open Farm Sunday, which is basically we open our gates and let the public come and have a, have a look and see what we're doing. Um, and that's the first of a few events that are happening over the, over the next uh, couple of years in the farm. We've got our top sale again in August. Um, and next September, that's September 2014, we've got the World Sheepdog Trials coming. So we've had the, the Scottish um, national here. We've had the international, which is the four, four home unions competing, but this one next year is the world, which is, well, the world. There's 25, 26 countries coming to compete, um, which is great. Tremendous for the area, tremendous for the Highlands. First time that event has come to Scotland, so we're pretty proud to be hosting that event. And um, we're going to put on a fair display and we'll have the farm looking well, hopefully, and um, the people will come and enjoy our area, enjoy the farm, enjoy the, the surrounding area, and, and most importantly, bring some money into the local economy and all the B&Bs and guest houses and hotels are getting booked up already so uh, pretty excited about that. So during the international that you held you had some special visitors as well. Yeah Princess Anne came which is really um, pretty cool to sit down and have lunch with her and talk about the farm and uh, yeah it's just great. Um, real boost for the, the local area and the, the kids from the local primary school came along and my girls presented her with some flowers and uh, oh, it was super yeah um, it's really good that you know, somebody like that will will come and back an event such as this. Um, we hope to see you back next time. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different people. Everybody's special that comes along to these events. There was people from all over the world attending the international, so um, they made a huge commitment to come. And, and next time with the world, well, that's a massive commitment coming from New Zealand with your own dog um, to, to trial sheep here. Don't scream, that only makes them angry. Away. How did it feel performing in front of royalty? Well, uh, it, it, it really was nice that the Princess Royal is here, and they, but it didn't feel any different. It didn't put extra pressure or nerves on me. It's nothing, uh, it was nothing like that. But it's because she's here to support of such course, an event. Of course, it's excellent. She's uh, the patron of the International Sheepdog Society, and uh, it, we were really privileged to have her uh, attend the event here and, uh, and we know she's got a busy schedule and we really appreciate the effort she's put in to come here.
It's good fun though, it's good, it, it lets locals interact with people from different parts of the world and make contacts and make friends and um, yeah, it should be a great event. And there's so much going on in the background of it all as well. Well, that time of year, uh, September, we'll be, um, we'll be harvesting on the farm, so there'll be lots going on there, there'll be um, plenty to see elsewhere on the farm. Um, and it's not just sheepdog trials at the trials, there's, there's the behind the scenes, there's craft tents, there's trade stands, there's, there's lots to see for everyone. Um, so, you know, come along, have a look, come along on one of the first couple of days and if you like it, come back for another day, um, it, it'll be a great event. So John, what, what's next on the farm? What's happening next? Well, we, we hope to finish off sowing the next couple of days. Um, it'd be good to get that done and all the, the, the crops rolled after that and then before you know it they'll be coming through the ground and we'll have to apply some fertiliser. Um, we nearly finished this lambing so once it's done we have a couple of weeks break and then we've got an outdoor lambing nearby and one up near Helmsdale as well to do so. Uh, there's a bit more lambing to come yet. Um, the cows are still calving. They should finish calving probably early June so we got to keep an eye on them but hopefully we'll get some warmth we'll just we can relax a little bit um, once all the the groundwork is done you know we'll chill out a wee bit there's turnips to go in later on in May and some forage crop but that won't take too much time um, so just enjoy the weather and, and enjoy farming May is the time at time of year April May is the time of year you should be able to enjoy farming when this when the, the summer sort of starts to come um, and you can see growth and lambs playing calves playing and yeah nice time of year now they're getting well through with lambing and calving and the groundwork's almost finished, it's time to get into the office for a, a, a couple of days and catch up with vital pap paperwork. Um, IAC's form has to be submitted by the middle of May and this is the crucial form that we as farmers submit to ensure that we um, receive subsidy, uh, which, without which we would really struggle. So we leave John here for the series, but we'll be coming back to Fern Farms throughout the summer. So join us in series two where you'll be able to catch up with all the news. Well that's the end of the series. Whether you live here or you hope to visit sometime then we hope to have shown you a little of what's happening right here in the Highlands. We'd love to hear from you about what you thought of the series and also what you'd like to see in series 2 which is coming later in the year. If you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter you'll be able to keep up to date with what the team are going to be up to. Thank you to all who sponsored and advertised in this series as without you it would not have been possible. If you have a business and you'd like to get involved by either way of sponsorship, advertising, or if you'd like to show just what it is that you do, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. We've been delighted with the hundreds of thousands of homes across the UK that have tuned in to see what's going on right here in the Highlands.